Welcome to Highways UK and today's session covering the topic how intelligent planning in consents and uh, consultation can reduce risk in projects and improve outcomes for all. My name's Richard Graham and I'm an industry practitioner helping infrastructure clients establish clear program outcomes, managing uncertainty to create infrastructure and services that define, define benefits to funders, users and key stakeholders. I'm delighted to be here today with Terry O'Neill of Temple Group, a leading environmental and planning consultancy to discuss this subject. Terry, welcome to Highways UK. Thanks, Richard. Good to be here. Tell me a little bit about yourself and Temple Group before we launch into the questions. Sure. Um, in very, very simple terms, uh, Temple Group is an environment and planning consultant. And our aim, as far as practicable, is to put the environment and communities at the heart of infrastructure to ensure optimal outcomes for clients, for stakeholders, for communities and for the environment. So we're going to talk in this insights discussion in three parts, defining the outcomes that infrastructure clients seek to achieve and benefits for whom, capturing the environmental consent risks that clients need to address and plan to mitigate risks, and then managing those risks through an effective consent process during infrastructure delivery. So Terry, if I can turn to the first point, what are the outcomes that infrastructure clients seek and what do you think sets a good client brief apart? Okay, uh, it's a good question to start with, Richard. Uh, for us, uh, a good uh, client and uh, a good brief is one there where there is clarity of vision, clarity of intended outcome, and also confidence in an ability of the client and its supporters to communicate that vision to stakeholders, to communities, and to the public in general to ensure there is absolute clarity of what is required. So we could spend a lot of time talking about transparency in terms of defining objectives and measures and also in triple bottom line. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about the stakeholders that we're serving here uh, and their, their requirements that drive um, clients' decisions? Absolutely. Um, everyone will be familiar with what we might describe as the statutory stakeholders, so those people that are, are required to be consulted in the event of uh, a new project. For example, Highways England could be a stakeholder. The more material aspect for us is the what we call the silent stakeholder, and that is in, for want of a better description, the environment. So be it flora, flora or fauna, um, there are clear impacts on those stakeholders as a result of any infrastructure work um, and clearly their concerns need to be voiced at a very early stage in project inception to ensure that they are protected and as far as practicable enhanced in any delivery. So tell me a little bit about the silent stakeholder because obviously they can't really tell you themselves about their needs and concerns. So what tools and techniques can you do as Temple to um, really extract what some of those outcomes should be? Sure. We make use of geospatial information systems uh, at, the very uh, at a very basic uh, starting point to ensure data can be captured. But increasingly, we will use web-based tools and web-based platforms to ensure that though that information can be kept up to date updates on a regular basis and can actually be communicated more widely. Um, increasingly, we're using augmented reality and virtual reality tools. We have our own VR tool called Aerial, um, which therefore allows clients and stakeholders and communities to actually see intended outcomes of an infrastructure project. Um, it's something we carried out recently for one of our clients called the Illuminated Rivers in London um, they were proposing to uh, relight some of the bridges in central London um, and probably for the, one of the first times in the UK, we compiled an environmental statement that was completely online, completely interactive and ensured the client and stakeholders and communities had complete visibility of the intended impacts and outcomes and mitigations for the scheme in question. So we've talked a little bit, Terry, about defining there though the importance of those outcomes for clients. If we can now turn to the second area, and the question here is, what are the key environmental and consenting risks that informed clients need to consider in achieving their intended outcomes? 
There are a multiplicity of issues with consenting, but none of them of themselves are overly complex. The biggest challenge that we face in talking, dealing with our clients is ensuring those are dealt with at the right time and in the right way. Uh, we have a client at the moment who um, is looking to uh, commence work on a, an aggregate unloading facility. Um, and they've worked really hard to get all the marine based consents, but for, unfortunately haven't actually got the land based consents. And that's now a major issue for them. They have a contractor they want to bring on site. Um, and they are now in an issue, now have a, an issue, big problem, with delay, um, a lack of trust, um, and loss of trust with communities and affected stakeholders. So, where we are now working really hard with them and other clients is to ensure that those uh, outcomes are envisaged well in advance of any required consent they're planned for and they're obtained, um, and then they're taken forward through the life cycle of the project. So it sounds like here we're talking about risk areas that aren't immediately obvious or visible and some of the techniques in terms of town hall meetings, engagements with stakeholders to capture the data that drives some of those underlying environmental risks. Can you tell me a little bit just very quickly about the types of risks, sort of the, the frequency or the impact that they have? Of course. Um, in a lot of cases, there is actually a low probability of these consents or uh, planning becoming an issue. Uh, the challenge for clients and for communities comes where there is an issue and that low probability translates very quickly into a high impact. And whether that high impact is in the form of delay, whether it's in the form of loss of trust or loss of uh, uh, community buy-in, inevitably um, that will be uh, an impact on the clients and inevitably that then becomes a cost which is either borne by the client or indeed by the taxpayer as a result of quite frankly insufficient and inadequate planning. So there's something in here around choice um, the strategic approach to risk management seems to be important that actually clients identifying they've got certain risk issues have got to take decisions around um, outcomes and the way to achieve them in delivery that's going to drive, if I'm understanding you correctly, Terry, um, good and bad outcomes. So it sounds like in this stage, the choices that are being made are quite critical for clients. If we can maybe move on and pick that point up in the next question in terms of delivery and spend a bit of time talking about how having established the outcomes that clients need and establishing a risk management method and all the decision logs that go with it, um, how we then get into delivery. So how does an experienced environmental and planning practitioner guide a client effectively through the delivery of consenting obligations to mitigate such risks? It's a really good question and it's uh, <laughs> a live one, as I'm sure you'd appreciate. Um, and I'll probably uh, to try and answer the question. It's probably easier just to quote by way of example. We've been working with HS2 for the best part of 10 years now. Um, and to be fair to HS2, they've been able to embed this spirit and understanding of impact on communities and stakeholders and the environment um, and have sought to um, carry those through uh, the project planning stages. And we've been able to work with them. We've been able to uh, consult with them and collaborate with them to ensure that that clarity of thinking and clarity of concern can therefore be translated through into the in this particular case the hybrid bill but then more materially into the documentation and strategies that the delivery partners and contractors are now taking forward to essentially enact the intended outcomes that hs2 have had in terms of um, improved outcomes for communities um, we haven't talked yet about social value and how communities uh, are looking to make sure a client like HS2 is able to deliver on those. The environment and pleasingly um, HS2 is now looking at net gain for its biodiversity to ensure that outcomes and what is intended as an outcome will actually be an improvement on where the environment was previously. So. Uh, it's a very, uh, a very involved uh, area, as I'm sure uh, your you listeners might appreciate. But I think if, if nothing else, um, ensuring, ensuring that the what is promised as a result of early planning is actually enacted is enormously helpful to ensuring clarity and confidence in delivery. 
So it sounds like there's quite a number of elements there. We're talking about assured process. We're talking about managing data and the discharge of the consenting requirements through the delivery process to bring the two things together that ultimately deliver the stakeholder requirements. Um, and we talked a little bit earlier on about trust as being a key component that if we don't get it right or we don't listen to those stakeholders at any point in this process, you can expect protest, you can expect delay, you can expect cost increase uh, to come about in this stage of work. So in terms of the tools and techniques that you've got at your disposal to help clients manage this, have you sort of had any experience where you've found that one thing has helped you particularly through this sort of detailed and, and quite complex process? Sure. Um, there's, a, again, a number of examples I can quote, but just to very quickly uh, pick up on two. So uh, Heathrow Airport, for all the challenges and uh, issues that the aviation sector has been facing and will now continue to face, um, they've always been very clear that the community engagement is very important for them. And we've helped them build pr platforms that allow communities to voice concerns, even on a day-to-day -day basis, around impacts that Heathrow and its community is having, which in turn allows them to build trust with their communities. Um, Tower Bridge um, is a project that we helped uh, deliver a few years ago now. Um, and for those of you that are aware of the geography uh, in that part of London, there are very few river crossings in uh, that part of London, which link East and South East London. And the impact on communities, on uh, the economy is quite significant for the intended bridge closure, which was what was planned to resurface the deck which had life expired and was therefore necessary for in continued safe operation. We work very closely um, um, over quite an extended period with the owner and a number of the stakeholders, including Transport for London, to ensure that those impacts could be mitigated as far as possible and to ensure that economic and uh, community impacts could also be uh, minimised to the extent that over a six month period, we were able to bring a three month construction period into being and actually complete it early. So that's interesting because what you've just mentioned there are some of the KPIs in terms of delivery to time, the date that these things are delivered, uh, the way they're delivered as being important in the dashboarding and the delivering of the outcomes. What's also is interesting in there is perhaps the experience required in this case. This isn't an exact science and that you're having to make trade-offs uh, in the choices that then drive the outcomes. So uh, I'm sure from a practitioner point of view, there's a lot of experience that's needed to help clients define some of these outcomes. I'm gonna to have to draw this to a conclusion now because there's been a very quick canter through uh, what's a very big area um, but sort of hopefully giving our listeners some insights as to how experienced practitioners should and can add value to their clients throughout the whole of this process when dealing with uh, managing environmental issues. We've talked about the importance of taking time in defining the clear outcomes, who benefits, what are the success criteria and the measures that need to be taken as part of a robust business case. We talked also about the issues concerning capture of risk and risk mitigation, including the importance of taking a strategic view, noting the characteristics of environmental risks being addressed. And finally, we've talked a little bit about the delivery issues, including techniques used to discharge consents effectively and to meet stakeholder requirements, as well as in managing the inevitable change that happens in large infrastructure projects. Terry, that's a quick summation, but from your point of view, do you want to give us any concluding thoughts or insights you'd like to share um, with your listeners? Of course. Thanks once again for your time, Richard. And I think my only observation would be uh, infrastructure is something that's either done with communities or to communities. And inevitably, um, where clients and stakeholders are interested in the former, we are very keen to work with them to ensure that trust is built, that intended outcomes are achieved, and that benefits are actually delivered. Thanks for your time. And thank you, Terry. Um, I hope that's been of interest to our listeners. It's a very big topic, uh, but thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>